Right now, we live in a world where having a unique perspective or a key insight is highly valuable. We hear a lot of words like innovation, thinking outside of the box, disruptive technology, and all of these have enormously positive connotations. But here's the interesting thing about having a unique perspective. Sometimes they don't occur as positive insights. Other times they occur as moments of disconnection, as moments of frustration when our perspective doesn't gel with our environment or with those around us. Today, I'd like to share with you my story of learning how to adapt my perspective to situations that didn't play to my strengths. I first learned that I have a very different perspective from most other people when I was in first grade. I was working on math problems with a group of my classmates when a particularly interesting problem jumped out at me. I turned to one of my friends and happily exclaimed, look at problem five. The green and blue numbers look really pretty next to each other. Silence followed. From the looks on my classmates' faces, I could tell that I had just said something very wrong. But I didn't know why. I looked down at the page and there it was. An emerald green four minus an ocean blue two to yield another two. But clearly my classmates were not seeing the same thing. In that moment of confusion, I made a quick decision. If seeing colored numbers was weird, I wouldn't say anything about it to anyone. And I did a pretty good job of sticking to that decision, even when seeing colored numbers began to give me trouble. You see, during second grade, my school introduced preparation for the California standardized test into our curriculum, and math classes began to emphasize speed and accuracy on arithmetic problems. To prepare us for the tests, my teachers started implementing timed tests, like this one, where the goal, I can see some of you are familiar with this, <laughs> and as some of, you, some of you will remember, the goal is to complete as many of these problems as accurately as possible within a finite amount of time. Now, I'd never seen problems laid out in this format before. Usually, they were laid out line by line with physical space between each problem, and this was new. What's more is that I wasn't seeing this. I was seeing this. And the first time that I took one of these tests, I became lost and disoriented. I couldn't focus my attention on problem by problem basis because I kept being distracted by numbers on the periphery of the page, numbers on the problem next to the problem I was working on. And as a result, unsurprisingly, I scored low. My teachers intervened and placed me in an after school help group for kids who were scoring low on these tests and set about assessing what the problem was. They were baffled when I had demonstrated solid mastery of the concepts and skills required to solve these problems, and when my speed was excellent on individual flashcards. No one could figure out what was going wrong. And while I had an idea of the problem, I had decided a year ago that I wasn't gonna say anything about this to anybody. <laughs> it wasn't until sixth grade that I slipped up, and during a conversation with one of my teachers, she started to understand and had a guess at what I was seeing when I looked at a math problem. And she pressed me, she asked me questions, and finally I relented, yes, I see colors for numbers and letters. And instead of an incredulous look, instead of silence, instead of scheduling a parent-teacher conference, she gave me a name for my experiences, synesthesia. I'd never heard this word before. It sounded scary, it sounded clinical, and I couldn't begin to understand what that meant. But I had the internet. So I took to searching online to learn everything that I could about how and why I see the world in the way that I do. So I started with that term, synesthesia. And what I discovered is that synesthesia is a broad term encompassing multiple forms of the blending of perceptions and senses. So to give you a couple examples, that's a pretty abstract definition. Some people see color when they hear music or sounds. Some people have spatial representations in their mind when they look at different numbers. And some people, like me, see colors for individual numbers and letters. This is termed color graphene synesthesia. How cool was that? There were other people who saw what I saw. I wasn't the only one. 
that was awesome. So I was excited and I wanted to learn even more. I knew what I was seeing, but I wanted to know why. Why was I seeing things differently? So I looked that up and what I learned, and the first idea that I found went something like this. Color grapheme synesthetes at a young age are exposed to colored letters as magnets or maybe on blocks that they play with and they just memorize them. This is a learned phenomenon. Okay, great. So if this ever became a disadvantage like it had in second grade, I could hypothetically just unlearn it. That was pretty cool. But it turns out that's not actually the case. The consensus opinion is that synesthesia is fundamentally a neurological phenomenon involving areas of the brain that process letters and numbers and the area of the brain that processes color. So as a sixth grader, at a stage of life when fitting in with my peers was of paramount importance, I had just learned that my brain was essentially wired differently from those around me. That took a little bit of time to think about. And I started to worry, well, if this is different, maybe it's bad, how long is this gonna last? I looked that up, and the answer was, synesthesia is lifelong. The associations are consistent, so what that means is that I see the number four as green, I will never see it as red or orange, and that it will last that way throughout my life. And that if I want to change it, I can't. Okay, well, maybe, maybe I didn't actually have true synesthesia. I mean, all of the websites I was looking at depicted synesthesia like this, as solid filled colored numbers and letters. But that's not what I saw. I saw something more like this, with color shadows or overlay effects, not a true solid filled number or letter. Well, maybe I didn't have true synesthesia, maybe my brain was actually normal. And it turns out that, no, this is how synesthetes experienced letters and numbers, that a synesthete can tell you that synesthesia is written in black font, but they also experience a strong color phantom with each of the letters comprising the word. So I had synesthesia. I thought about this. I thought about the significance of having a brain that was different, but before I got too caught up with this line of thinking, I entered one final search. Who has synesthesia? Now, it's likely that there are one or two of you sitting in this room who have synesthesia, and I want to assure you that you're in good company. <laughs> synesthesia alums include Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winning physicist, and a lot of musicians like Mary J. Blige report having synesthesia, which is pretty cool. And it wasn't like I couldn't remember times when synesthesia had given me certain advantages in activities that I was pursuing. Learning to type on a keyboard, for example. That had come quickly. I had a mental representation of the colors for each of the keys in my mind, and if I forgot where one of the keys was on the board, I would just look down, scan for the corresponding color, and I was good to go. But where things got really interesting was during high school, when I started taking more advanced math classes. I distinctly remember sitting in my first calculus lecture and watching my teacher work through a problem involving multiple variables. And all I could think was, that's beautiful. Because what I was seeing, <laughs> that may not be a consensus opinion, but, <laughs> but what I was seeing was that there, there's this array of multicolored numbers and variables that were shifting, combining, permuting, disassociating, and it was so cool. As high school continued, I realized that I liked this math thing, that I wanted to do more of it, and my goal became to major in science or engineering when I attended college. Now, to prepare for this, I needed to score pretty well on the SAT math section, and so I started taking practice tests. The practice tests went smoothly, so I was surprised that when I sat for the actual test, I felt slow and sluggish on several of the problems. When the proctor called the five minute mark, I felt like something wasn't right, and I turned in the test, deciding, okay, don't worry about it, just wait until the score comes back. And when it did, I felt like I was in that second grade help group all over again. 
I'd scored low, and I didn't know why. Despite having solid mastery of the skills and the knowledge required to solve the problems. So what was going on? I thought about the differences between the practice test and the actual test. Well, maybe it was test anxiety, but no, I didn't fit, I didn't fit the description. Maybe it's differences in the content between the two tests, but that was almost identical. What was it? Well, I remembered that when I took the practice test, I solved the problems on white color printer paper that I'd taken from my house. And that when I took the actual test, that test was printed on filmy gray paper and that I solved all, of, and I did all of my scratch work on the test itself. Okay, so that was definitely a difference, but was that it? I thought about this more. And I realized that the three, most com the three of the most common variables on the SAT, X, Y, and Z, for me, appear as slight variations of that color gray of the SAT paper. Now, that seemed to be not just a coincidence. So I took to the internet once again to figure out what was going on. And what I found was a paper from a, from a prominent neuroscientist documenting that the intensity of the color that color graphene synesthetes experience for individual letters and numbers decreases significantly as the color of the background paper matches more closely with that of the letter or number. Now that made sense. But at the same time, while I was excited that I had found potentially the core of the issue that I was having with the test, I still didn't know what to do. And I was crushed that the thing that was helping me succeed in high school math classes was now potentially going to thwart me from pursuing my dream of studying science and engineering in college. But then I thought back to second grade. I'd, ha I'd solved the problem then, and there was no reason that I shouldn't be able to solve it now. So I started practicing. I did all of my work, I, I did all of my work on gray paper so that it emulated the format that I would see when I took the test. And for problems that had particularly complicated combinations of X, Y, and Z, I recoded the variables. I used A, B, and C, which for me are yellow, blue, and red. Very different from the gray color that I saw for the SAT test. Now, at the end of the day, I retook the test, and this time when I got my score back, I felt confident enough to submit my applications to the schools of my choice. I was accepted to my top choices for technical undergraduate colleges, and I enjoyed spending the past four years here in Claremont at Harvey Mudd College studying science and engineering. So what I want to leave you today is, is a message about adaptation. On the one hand, adapting our message to reach as many people as possible while being cognizant of the fact that there's a massive diversity of human perception present in the world. And on the other hand, knowing how to adapt our own unique perspectives to challenges that don't play to our strengths. Understanding that these challenges are not reflections on us or our abilities. And knowing that in the process of working to adapt our perspective, we're expanding the, the dialogue and helping the world better understand the idea that we're trying to fit our perspective to. Thank you so much.